So, Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense by Thomas Reed. Chapter 1, Section 1. <coughs> the importance of the subject. Why is it important to know how the human mind works? <laughs> and the means of prosecuting it. How the hell do we actually investigate, inquire, and judge yep. how to yep. prosecute? Do you want to read it out? I think that's the way to go, don't you? Yeah, go for it. The fabric of the human mind is curious and wonderful, as well as that of the human body. The faculties of the one are with no less wisdom adapted to their several ends than the organs of the other. Nay, it is reasonable to think that as the mind is a nobler work and of a higher order than the body, even more of the wisdom and skill of the divine architect has been employed in its structure. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. And again, I think it, you know, it ties back to quite right to say it's very worthy to look into this whole thing because of the influence it has over every branch of science that involves observation, experiment, experimentation, or perception of any kind, which basically covers all of science. Exactly. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, um, you're not going to be able to do science without thinking about it. Yeah, or without whatever, observing it, hearing it, touching it, tasting it, you know. I mean, you think of any physical chemistry physics biology yeah it kind of it definitely is necessary that the human mind is involved <laughs> and if we don't know how it fucking works then what use is any of that knowledge if we're going from faulty assumptions or something actually it says there with account kind of the extensive influence which the knowledge of it has over other every other branch of science yeah there's a couple of ways to maybe even interpret that right so yeah. who, who has the knowledge over how the mind works is also at a, an advantage. Yeah. Okay, we'll continue. Yep. Yeah. Mind is also the subject upon which we operate. The painter, the poet, the actor, the orator, the moralist, and the statesman attempt to operate upon the mind in different ways and for different ends. And they succeed according as they touch properly the strings of the human frame. Nor can their several arts ever stand on a solid foundation or rise to the dignity of science until they are built upon the principles of the human constitution. As a statesman um, or, or as a orator, I'm going to be using certain aspects of the human mind either in my own, in my own way while I'm performing that act um, or knowing how the mind of the spectator or the perceiver is going to to take it uh, whatever i'm saying so um yeah hugely important right for every single thing or every yeah. single domain yeah nor can any of the civil arts ever stand on a solid foundation so unless you really understand the mind you're not and and have a good understanding of the principles of human constitution you're not going to understand it you're not going to be able to actually do your job his language is sort of poetic you know they succeed according as they touch properly the strings of the human frame it, yeah it's it's a sort of a poetic way of saying it yep absolutely yep. i think in those days though it was probably just better writing than the people who write now right <laughs> you know, the dumbing down of the language and, you know, the, the millennials that can't spell anymore, yeah, or use acronyms for everything. And I think in those days there was just a just a better degree of, of using vocabulary and grammar that, yep. again, I, th I would point back to the way the education has declined, right? No trivium yep. and, and just subjects. So I think it reflects that. But, yeah, I think he was a, a man with a great turn of phrase too. I was sort of saying it's a bit, uh, bit uh, um, poetic, but by the same token, it's actually prose, but it's artistic sort of prose, where a lot of the writing, especially writing like this, you know, philosophical, scientific type writing, has become sort of mechanical. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, it, it just yeah, it comes across sometimes as archaic and quaint. But if you analyze it properly, then there's actually no better way to phrase it than the way he's doing it. As you say, the oh. mechanistic examples don't convey the overall importance or, or I don't know, meaning of it. Yep. Wise men now agree, or ought to agree in this, that there is but one way to the knowledge of nature's works, the way of observation and experiment. By our constitution, we have a strong propensity to trace particular facts and observations to general rules and to apply such general rules to account for other effects or to direct us in the production of them. This procedure of the understanding is familiar to every human creature in the common affairs of life, and it is the only one by which any real discovery in philosophy can be made. You know, observation and experiment is what is now defined to be empirical science. You know, if we if you look at the definition of empirical science, then those are the two words that will crop up, observation yeah. and experiment. Um, I think that's slightly wrong nowadays in that it's been divorced from the rest of this paragraph in that, you know, this, this connection to our constitution um, yeah. and to the human mind and to the senses is where empirical science has lost its way and abstracted it because we don't take that relative observer into account, you know, unless we're talking metaphysical Einstein bullshit. And I think we need to be very cognizant that every observation and experiment involves a sentient being. And that sentient being is a part of that observation and experiment. And that's why it's very important. Yeah, well, it, it hasn't mentioned common sense there, but you can sort of see that's where he's heading with the, by our constitution, we have a strong propensity. Yep. And when we look at things, right? or we observe things, or we experiment with them, then yes, we try to make a general rule out of that particular instance which we are observing. You know, one of the things we try to do is continuously relate, compare, ratiocinate, um, you know, look at ratios of proportions and understand what's actually happening and try to make a general rule to us, or to direct us in the production of them, which again is practicality, right? That means to actually demonstrate or to produce that effect again by demonstration, um, which you know ties into the necessity to to demonstrate practically what is going on. Otherwise, you can just tell fairy stories. This procedure of the understanding is familiar to every human creature in the common affairs of life, and, and it is day to day things. You you show somebody you want to make somebody understand something, you show them. You show them how it's done. Yep. And it might be, you know, even something as simple as waving arms and making, you know, making gestures, right, which yeah. signify something or it, it, you know, it really is a practical demonstration from, from start to finish, yeah? which goes yep. through uh, whatever steps that, you know, are logically deducible from where you started. Observation and experiment today seems to include mathematics. I would say so too, and it's it's off on that inductive principle, which is you know okay, let's generalize, you know, let's let's come up with a rule, and we'll take it as fact until we can find some contradiction to it, and the, the, so, somehow these contradictions seem to be ignored. You know, if we take the example of Andy Water, um, then science doesn't seem to adhere to its principles of listening to contradictions, and no. and instead you know adhere to the principle of well, mathematics shows it, so. Let's forget those contradictions to common sense or to, you know, the foundation of knowledge. I think a prime example is they've been able to call a curve level by using gravity as the reason. Yep, an invisible fictive force that is apparently a cause, whereas, you know, everybody really knows that all Newton did was write down laws that describe the effect and a theory at the end of the day that is still to be demonstrably, practically proven. We still yeah. don't have two masses that attract each other, and we still can't find a spinning fucking ball. Yeah. And, and in every example we have of um, what how water operates is that it always finds its level. Yep. And just because they can redefine what level means mathematically and obviously get everybody educated to, or conditioned is a better word, or schooled to believe it, 
doesn't make it fucking correct. It's just a a, a wrong popular opinion, <laughs> um, and certainly not common sense as defined by Reed. The man who first discovered that cold freezes water and that heat turns it into vapor proceeded on the same general principles and in the same method by which Newton discovered the law of gravitation and the properties of light. His regulae philosophandi are maximum, maxims of common sense and are practiced every day in common life. And he who philosophizes by other rules, either concerning the material system or concerning the mind, mistakes his aim. Yeah, the, this paragraph is very open to critical challenge, and 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 why shouldn't it be? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think also mistaken a lot, because Absolutely. when when you read into what Reed actually means by that, then he's basically saying that you know what Newton did. Um, one of the maxims of common sense is that life is going to be pretty much the same today as tomorrow, given the same circumstances is basically the same maxim that the nature of laws are uniform and constant and and they do not change at will so you know the absurd idea that at some unspecified radius water starts to bend is absurd uh, even from a newtonian perspective yeah because one of his philosophies was that these things are constant and 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 uniform you know i'm not defending newton necessarily i'm not sure whether he was a good guy a bad guy misunderstood misinterpreted but the way reed reads newton's works was definitely one that as far as he was concerned was in aligned with with common sense principles and not just mathematical sophistry well what, yeah would you say we have serious doubts i, I don't believe in it yeah, I don't believe it's the cause of anything. Yeah, does it describe the effects of of, of things gravitating towards the Earth, i.e., falling to the ground? Yes, you can say that the the formulas and equations do come up with the correct results, but that's not the same thing as saying that there is something called gravity that is holding water to a ball. His point was. Yes, Newton had, you know, devised calculus and various mathematical, I don't want to call it trickery, but ways and processes of, of dealing with physical observations. Yes, he came up with things that describe the effects that we see. If you, if you follow only those things to the end, i.e. radicalize that, then, then that's okay. It's just when the metaphysical argument came in and, and we were all supposed to believe in, in space balls or mass attracting each other, which I don't think necessarily read condones. Yeah? Um, but at the same time, I, I'm not sure. And all I can say is that anybody listening, everybody needs to take from read what they think is correct. I'm not 100% on board with everything Reed says either. And hey, is the man fallible like everybody else? I'm bloody sure he was. And uh, I think where, where Reed differs from him, and, and Reed is very radical in that, is he says, don't let metaphysical arguments enter this discussion, which <clears throat> I think people accuse Newton of doing later in life, but his very first books were without it. So he made very clear, for example, in his regular philosophy that he was not claiming that gravitation was the cause of anything. He made it very clear that all he had found was an equation that described the effects you know, and it's other people, or maybe Newton himself later in life, that that started to then, I don't know, believe his own bullshit or yeah. enter into metaphysical arguments, right, about the cause of things. Whereas, no, it's just a description of effects, a mathematical description of effects. And I think that's where Reed is basically saying, yeah, that part is fine, there's nothing wrong with it. And I would agree with him. The first maxims I think that Newton laid down was that I think the phrase goes something like no more causes of natural things should be admitted than are both true and sufficient to explain the phenomena, right? So don't bring other stuff into the equation which has nothing to do with it. And that's where Reed would say, yes, that's the correct way of doing it. And it was originally Newton's whatever maxim when he wrote his uh book which he then seems to stray from in later life, or, yep. or, or people now at least attribute to him. Also, one thing that Newton did was he tried very hard in all his books to write down his first principles. So for, for Reed, also an important topic, or for anybody discussing anything with anybody, is to exactly define what you mean by certain words and terms. 
And that's, again, a thing where Reed praises Newton for having done it properly. So yeah. you know, I think when he when he says maxims of common sense and practice every day in common life, then then those are the things that he means, and certainly not the metaphysical arguments that come out of the later writings. Conjectures and theories are the creatures of men and will always be found very unlike the creatures of God. If we would know the works of God, we must consult themselves with attention and humility without daring to add anything of ours to what they declare. A just interpretation of nature is the only sound and orthodox, orthodox philosophy. Whatever we add of our own is apocryphal and of no authority. We don't need to, to whatever, skip over the fact that we did believe in a God. He did believe that this was some kind of creation. Um, I think anybody looking at it objectively has to at least think about that and doubt the story of it all being a big accident. Usually in his writings, he refers to things like nature or the divine architect or, you know, sometimes he uses the word God, but it, it's not somebody who stuffs it down your throat. So it's obvious, at least for me, that, yes, he believed there was a creation. And when he went on to study his moral philosophy, then things like, you know, this inherent um, a priori moral, you know, judgment of right and wrong, I think he believed that we do come that way and that's part of our constitution um, and yeah. I'm inclined to agree with them but speculation about God is is best left out at the moment I'm more interested in his natural philosophy here than than taking that next step yeah. that we all make mistakes the creatures of men and whoever made this place <laughs> had a better idea of what to do than all our speculation yeah I can go along with that <laughs> look at it for what it is and don't hypothesize in a way isn't it yeah don't add any more bullshit to the story right to my to my way of thinking there is just no way the complexity of what we can experience now you know a just interpretation of nature if you just look at what's around you if you look at how things work if you have even the most basic understanding of microbiology and things like that you 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 can see that there's just no way known it happened by chance. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the creation creationists, let's call them, especially the scientists among them, have shown pretty clearly that a lot of the things happen at the microscopic level or smaller are actually little machines that are very similar to the machines that we build, yeah, on a macroscopic yeah. level. And at the same time, you know, what, what Reed's trying to say here, this, this, uh, um, us trying to interpret things can never be as good as how the creator's blueprints were. You know, I would agree with the, the idea that we can come up with a, a theory of evolution that changes squirrels into fish and monkeys, right? Just seems preposterous against the theory that, hey, some guy, thing, person, consciousness had a fucking real plan and built this stuff, you know, because yeah. Yeah, I certainly don't believe in, in, in the accidental, you know, story that they tell us. Yeah. I, I just think what I'm continuously want to do is suspend those conversations and discussions until we figure out where the fuck we are. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's still an important question, but like you say, it not, may, need not necessarily be answered right now until yeah. we know where we are. Yeah, I agree. I think it's the timing because it's very easy then to get caught up in arguments and, and we're talking about something 100 miles down the road, yeah, and we don't know where we're standing yet. The main message that, that I have, at least to everybody, is is don't do that. Let's all start from the same starting point. And when yeah. we get 100 metres down the road, then hopefully we'll have more knowledge to be able to have that discussion better because conjectures and theories are the creatures of men is exactly what I don't want to do without fucking knowing where I am. Right? Uh, apocryphal. Um, a story or statement of doubtful authenticity, although widely circulated as being true. <laughs> uh -huh. There's a lot of that going on. Well, there's certainly a lot of that going around, yeah. <laughs> yeah, all our curious theories of the formation of the earth, of the generation of animals, of the origin of natural and moral evil, so far as they go beyond a just induction from facts, are vanity and folly, no less than the vortices of Descartes, 
or the Archaeus of Paracelsus. Well, would I say most intelligent human being you could imagine could never, ever come close. Exactly. I, I always get back to that one example, you know, that even if the best engineer in the world could design a mechanical telescope that functions just like the eye, would it see like an eye? No, because the, the sentient being is missing to which the eye is attached, right? <laughs> so, you know, that whole creation is, is completely different just from the mechanical part. And well, how, the, how the fuck do you do that is just, you know, beyond me, beyond our comprehension, right? Perhaps the philosophy of the mind hath been no less adulterated by theories than that of the material system. The theory of ideas is indeed very ancient and hath been very universally received. But as neither of these titles can give it authenticity, they ought not to screen it from a free and candid examination, especially in this age when it has produced a system of scepticism that seems to triumph over all science and even over the dictates of common sense. I thought that might have been the next word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is a part of his overall, how should I say, challenge to the to the idealistic and and what what ultimately ends up as a skeptical view of the world, that everything is just a barrage of ideas, and and he points out again and again that everybody seems to have made the same mistake. You know that, that this ideal theory is actually very ancient. Every single philosopher that he can look at has made the same mistake of believing too much that ideas are what rules the world or what rules you know how we think about things um, and that that's where a lot of the problems arise because it ultimately ends up in skepticism and you not being able to believe in anything which leads to a how should i say a very demoralizing view yeah, just because they're ancient and they've been universally received doesn't give them authenticity doesn't make them that doesn't make them true yep I mean, that's the typical pointing out these fallacies, right? The authority or popular opinion does not mean truth, and which is why he does great in this book. You know, I mean, he rips idealism apart. He has a, yeah. a fight over, you know, tens of years with the greatest philosophers of the time, Locke, Hume, you know, and shows that what they're doing is, is wrong. They seem to be making assumptions they shouldn't be making um, and overlooking how the mind works. You know, this idea that, you know, we can remove the sentient being or we can divorce and think about abstract things without, you know, tying them to substance or bodies. All of these things are making always the same mistake or, or thinking that, you know, images are only in our head and have nothing to do with, with how our eyes work or, you know, all these things have been overlooked time and time again. Yeah, when you, when you think about the fact is this was written 300 years ago and it's still the same today. Yep. Yeah, unfortunately, that skepticism still exists. That that idealism is still the preeminent philosophy. Definitely, I mean, there's so many ideologies at the moment in the world, right? Um, yeah. You can see it every day in in politics, or, and it's definitely in science. There's still all this, you know, ideas and speculation and metaphysical arguments are the things that seem to be driving the the explanation of the world and. You know, why are people not talking about, you know, real facts and, and deduction and, and not just hypothesis and induction and, and then ignoring the rules of induction by ignoring contradictions? All that we know of the body is owing to anatomical dissection and observation. And it must be by an anatomy of the mind that we can discover its powers and principles suppose in a way he's just saying you know let's be diligent and and let's go go about this in a scientific way rather than just introspection you know the 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 common idea of philosophers just sitting there coming up with fancy stories um he's basically saying let's do this scientifically please which is i think exactly what his book differs from everybody else's in, <coughs> or in philosophy in that not only was the man capable of it because of his background expertise glenn yeah the fact that he was a whatever a mathematician and a physicist and <clears throat> and all these things but it really is the difference between him and everybody else that you know he was always pushing for real scientific method and process and i think that's why he 
he kind of brings up the Newton thing. Let's attack this with the same diligence which, with which Newton attacked it. And that's definitely where he differs. I think we should stop it there. Yeah, I agree.